Hi, and welcome to the channel, Taff Williams Reads. For my first book, I've chosen Shenanigans from a Cumbrian Village by Martin Lloyd. A hilarious compilation of short stories from a Welshman who moved to Cumbria and fell in love with the village and its people. The Foreword by Darren Meacham You need a village if only for the pleasure of leaving it. A village means that you are not alone. Knowing that there are people, the trees, the earth, there is something that belongs to you, waiting for when you were not there. Visiting the village is like entering the twilight zone. Everyone is on the piss, and everyone takes the piss. Chapter 1. Introduction. I was born and raised in Wales. The roughest part of Wales is South Wales. The roughest and poorest part of South Wales is the valleys. A typical valley town is Aberdeer. The roughest parts of Aberdeer were the council estates. That is where I was born and lived for the first 25 years of my life. With industry in the region in decline, my wife and I decided to seek a better and more secure future for our family. I successfully applied for a position with a company based in Burrow in Furness and moved to Cumbria with my wife and three young children. For the first two years, we rented a farmhouse cottage in the idyllic South Lakeland village called Little Brunswick. We immediately felt a warmth and friendliness from the local community and our children settled well in the small local school. We purchased a small terrace cottage in the village where we have lived happily to this day. This book is a light-hearted collection of stories loosely based on the characters of real people from the villages of Great and Little Brunswick. Some of the characters have sadly passed away but will always be fondly remembered. The real names of the characters have been altered to protect people's identities. No offence is intended or meant. Chapter 2. Adapting to Village Life The culture change of moving to a Cumbrian village was like a breath of fresh air. Everything and everybody seemed to be so practical. Fashion trends were non-existent and hardly any of the females wore makeup. Shit and Wellingtons seemed to be order of the day. The village pubs were the heart and soul of the community. If anybody wanted or needed anything, the pub was always the first port of call. Chapter 3 our first visitor. We settled well into our rented farmhouse cottage which was attached to a barn conversion. The people who lived in the barn conversion had a small small holding and kept numerous animals. Our back garden had a parking space accessed from the side of the house and adjoined the small holding. We invited a close friend to come and stay with us one weekend. When he arrived he was pleased as punch, showing us the brand new car he had just purchased, a gleaming Volvo. I told him to park it at the back of the cottage. We had a nice meal and spent a pleasant evening recalling memories. The following morning I got up quite early and started preparing breakfast. I looked out of the kitchen window and I could not believe what I saw. There was this huge goat that was attached to a long chain and he was standing on top of the brand new car. I rushed out and tried to pull the goat down but the stupid animal wouldn't move. I alerted our neighbours and they eventually managed to get the goat down from the car. I went to examine the roof and fortunately there was no serious damage. There were just a few scratches made by the goat's hoofs which could easily be sorted at minimum cost. At breakfast I had the formidable task of explaining to my friend what had happened. After examining his car my friend said don't worry about it. I will get it sorted when I get back home. And I thought welcome to village life. Chapter 4 The Signet The only pub in the village of Little Brunswick was called The Signet, a quaint and typical country pub with open fires and real ale. The landlord's name was Seamus, a jovial, overweight port drinker and snuff taker. He would never drink alcohol when behind the bar, but used to consume copious amounts of tea in a pint mug. The only day he would consume alcohol was on his day off on a Thursday. Every Thursday he used to go down to the nearby market of town of Alston, Thursday was known locally as Pig Day due to the farmer's market being on and all of the Alston pubs being open all day. Pig Days were a boom for the town pubs, with most of them doing brisk trade all day long. Seamus used to visit most of the hostelries and get intoxicated every Thursday. From Friday to the following Wednesday, his only alcohol consumption was a small glass of very expensive vintage port, which he had a real passion for. His other passion was to consume copious amounts of snuff, which often coagulated around his moustache and beard. 
Occasionally, some snuff particles would drop into pints of beer he was serving. It was always best to order a pint before he shoved a huge amount up his nose. There was no such thing as opening hours. If you fancied a drink, Seamus would serve you. Stop tap didn't exist. If there were folk in the pub, you got served. The clientele were a right mixture of characters, who all seemed to get on well. Engineers, dustbin men, managers, council chief executives, carpet fitters, doctors, welders, nurses, and Carl salesmen, etc., etc. There were no cliches, snobbery or malice, and everyone contributed to the various discussions and arguments. If you were short of money, you could have drinks on credit, the slate, and settle on payday. Chapter 5 Please don't sit in the fire. Rob was quite an influential member of the community. His house was one of the largest and most expensive in the village. He was the chief executive of the local borough council. He originated from Scotland and retained his broad Scottish accent. Tall, angler and very intelligent, with a very dry sense of humour. Like the rest of the village, he enjoyed a few pints and occasional whisky. One Christmas, after work, Rob invited his second-in-command, Mark, a respected pillar of the community, with quite a snobby and condescending attitude, to celebrate the festive season. Now, Mark was an extremely moderate drinker, who rarely exceeded two pints. Mark was very well-dressed, in an expensive made-to-measure suit, shirt, tie, and highly polished shoes. As the evening progressed, Rob kept saying, Come on, have another one. It's Christmas and I'm paying. We were congregated around the bar and could clearly see that Mark was becoming excessively intoxicated. Mark said, where is the toilet? I think I'm going to be sick. Rob indicated a mark where the gentleman's toilet was, the entrance door being beside the roaring open log fire. Mark left his seat and started to stagger erratically to the toilet door. The scene was funnier than watching the Bolshoi Ballet. Before he reached the toilet door, he stumbled over the fire hearth, did a 360 degree turn and sat directly into the roaring fire. Fortunately, two of the regulars sitting close by quickly grabbed his arms and pulled him out. Being so drunk, he didn't realise what was going on. His trousers and underpants had burned, leaving two gaping holes with his arse cheeks sticking out. Fortunately, the skin burns were only minor. We removed his trousers and underpants, and the landlord administered some basic first aid. Cream. The landlord then kindly provided Mark with a pair of his own triple XL underpants, to provide some decency. We sat Mark down and Rob decided to call a taxi and send Mark home. A week later, Rob said that Mark was okay. Arse a bit sore, but the burns were only minor. He told Rob that he could not remember anything about the fire and that his wife, another snob, was absolutely furious and still not speaking to him due to the embarrassment she felt by him turning up in someone else's underpants. We never saw Mark in our village pub ever again. For more, please click on episode 2 of Shenanigans from a Cumbrian Village, read by Taff Williams. Thank you.